Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the First World War. I am Mike B. And today we're going to be talking, after having not made a video in a few months, about a topic that I've been wanting to make a video on for years and just recently finally got the missing piece of the puzzle. And that is going to be, as you can see in the title, the main firearms issued to American Expeditionary Force soldiers in the First World War. So I'll just give you a brief rundown and kind of the supply issue and why the... Um, why you're going to see more of certain ones, and we'll talk about that a little bit, but I just want to kind of make this about the firearms. Uh, I've already made videos on the preparedness or lack thereof of the Americans to enter the First World War, <clears throat> and supplies were really low. So different firearms that weren't really in the arsenal before 1917 um, really started getting ramped up in production, and uh, there was one in specific that we'll talk about, one of the main firearms. And then um, we'll talk about the sidearms too, the main sidearms. So we'll do the main rifles and the main sidearms. As far as machine guns go, I don't, A, I don't have a BAR and B, there weren't really a lot of them fielded until about October 1918 is when you started actually seeing them getting fielded. We use a lot of French and British weapons, just, just throwing that out there. So there are only a few U.S. actual weapons that you're going to see in mass on the front, on the Western front in 1918 and in the Italian front with limited limited use, um, but that's a, that's a different story. Anyway, so we're just going to kind of go through these. I'll give you a little rundown on the history of them. So the first one when we entered the war that most of the troops were equipped with was the Model 1903. So this is chambered in 30-06 or 30 caliber 19-06, um, better known or not better known, but if you're one of the metric types, it's the 7.62 by 63 millimeter in the U.S. and pretty much, uh, I think the whole world knows what a 30-06 is as far as that name is concerned. Anyway, so these were made by both Springfield Armory and Rock Island Arsenal. This one's a 1918 dated Rock Island Arsenal in original configuration, which is really hard to find because a lot of these got updated over the years. Anyway, so these were the preferred rifle of the soldiers and Marines at that time. And it was an American design. Um, it really actually was. It, it was influenced by Mauser, but I don't know, that's, that's a different video. But here's the thing is when we were involved, when we got involved in the First World War, our military only stood about 200,000 strong. So there weren't a lot of these and they were expensive to produce and they were slower to produce than another rifle that we were making for an allied country uh, since 1914, which we'll talk about next. But you're going to see these being used by primarily the units that went over there within the first few months, such as the 1st Division, the 2nd Division, the 3rd Division, and um, the Marine Corps. So the 1903 is going to be the main rifle that was used by those big divisions. And then other divisions did use them, but we're going to talk about that in a second. Uh, some of the National Guard units, like the 32nd and 42nd Divisions, were issued these because they had been on the Mexican border in the previous year, 1916, being federal service for the Mexican border crisis, and were they um, their states bought fed new brand new federal equipment, so that's why those National Guard units were activated with the other units that were going over there immediately, is because they were just on the border, they were just federalized, and they had all this brand new equipment. All they had to do was do a little bit of training, and then head over there. So. National Guard units, a couple of them, and the active army at that point, and then the Marines. So, it's fed from a five-round charger. This one actually is an Aurora 1 Vintage. I don't know, I had a couple of them and don't know where they went. And yeah, it's just like anything else. You just put it in the bridge, pop the rounds down, and uh, there you go. So yeah, the Model 1903, it was not actually the main rifle, though. It was pretty evenly matched with... The model 1917. Now a lot of people call this the 1917 Enfield or the 1917 Eddie Stone. First of all, it's really not an Enfield design. It's, I mean, there's a couple of little things that look similar like the safety and all that stuff, but it's its own design. It's actually more of a Mauser style action than it is an Enfield. It, it was designed in the you know, Great Britain and we were manufacturing it as the pattern 14 rifle in 303 British. So in 1917 we had three manufacturers, Eddie Stone, Remington and Winchester manufacturing these for the British. So to call it a 1917 Eddie Stone is like calling uh, an M1 rifle or an M1 carbine like a Rockola M1, even though it's made by Inland or something else. So that's kind of just some technical things. But this is just the U.S. model, um, U.S. rifle model of 1917, and it is also chambered in 30-06. So what we did is instead of making a new rifle or just pumping out 1903s faster, setting up a new factory, they retooled and rechambered. The pattern 14 to 30 6 which actually allowed you to pick up an extra round because this is a rimless cartridge. 
So this magazine will hold six rounds, plus you can put one in the chamber for a total of seven to start out with, but it is fed from the same five round chargers that are compatible with the 1903. So what happened was uh, these got insanely mass produced during the First World War. There weren't any made after 1919, and there's still this many floating around. There were literally millions made by these three arsenals in that short amount of time. Now, what that meant was units that were going over later, like towards the end of 1917, um, that were training and being formed because most units didn't even exist before the, the First World War, uh, they were going to be issued the model 1917. Now, there's so many different conflated numbers and people that um, disagree on the numbers, and there's so many different stats about what was the ratio of 1903s to 1917s. Some as high as 75% of the AEF use these, and some as low as 40% of the AEF. What I've seen and what makes the most sense to me is probably it was 60% the 1917, just due to all the units that were subsequently formed, and not not even all of them actually made it into combat by the end of 1918 because it ended sooner than everybody was expecting. 1919 would have been the massive offensive and a bloodbath for all on the Western Front, but um, nevertheless, those units were mainly equipped with the Model 1917. One notable unit, um, actually, yeah, we'll, we'll just go with one notable unit. Everybody knows about Alvin York, or they think they do. It's fun stuff. If you dig deeper into that story, you find uh, how propaganda worked back then, very similarly to nowadays. Anyway, so Alvin York was in the 82nd Division, which became the 82nd Airborne Division, and his unit was issued the 1917. Now, if you watch the Alvin York movie that was made shortly after the First World War, he's got a 1903. They called this the British Rifle. A lot of people didn't like it because it wasn't American. Well, it worked, and a good chunk of the AEF, whether you think it was 50%, 60% or 75, I'd say, I'd say 60% of them had this rifle and 40% um, had the 1903. It might be 75, 25. I don't know. I have actually not been able to get a straight answer on that. So that's my opinion based on research that I've done. That is not a stone cold fact. Anyway, so that is the 1917, the rifle model of 1917. The most common pistol sidearm that you're going to find used by the American Expeditionary Force in the First World War is not the Colt Model 1911. We'll get to that in a second, though. That was the missing piece that I just acquired. It was actually the Colt Model 1917, which was actually already in production as the Colt um, single action, double action, large frame revolver. This one was particularly a civilian gun that was chambered in 455 Ely before that, uh, and then 45 long or 45 long Colt, 40, 4, 45 Ely or 455 Ely. And then it got stamped over to be 45 ACP when it was adopted into military service. And it got its serial number and all that stuff on the bottom. So this was actually a civilian pistol that was converted to take uh, 45 ACP with. And this is loaded with half moon clips. So really quickly, I'll just talk about these. So these guys, are those little pouches you're going to see, those little triple pouches, are going to be for these. A lot of times guys carry these in their pockets. Um, why they use the half moon clips and not a full moon clip, I don't know. But at the time, that's what these were. So you got three rounds on each. You pop the cylinder open and you just drop them in like this. So it was better than some of the other foreign revolvers that required, you know, single loading and all that stuff. But, um, yeah, so the Colt Model 1917, it was, it was very popular and used more for a few reasons. One, auto-loading handguns were pretty new at that time and were still rather expensive to produce and to own, you know, privately. And if you look at the makeup of the military, most of the people were either from um, the inner city or they were from, you know, the majority of people or they were from the country. Both of those people were going to be familiar with the revolver being, you know, not necessarily more wealthy or even middle class in the U.S. Everybody at that point would have been familiar with a revolver and how it operates um, if they're familiar with firearms in general. Whereas auto loaders such as the 1911 were really new at that point still. I mean, Think about it, 1911 to 1917, that's only six years of it being, you know, actually used in the military, much less being available for private purchase. They were expensive and all that stuff. So these were extremely effective. They were cheap to produce. They were easy to produce. <clears throat> Sorry, a little voice crack there. They were easy to, easier to produce and they were faster to produce than the 1911, just like the 1903 versus the 1917. So these were the most common sidearm that was issued to U.S. troops. Smith & Wesson also made a few of them. Not, you know, several thousand, but in comparison to how many Colt pumped out, it's not really comparable. So that's why they commanded premium because less of them were made. They're going to have a round 
sight, and I'm going to say Smith & Wesson. They look a little bit different, but they load the same, and they shoot the same caliber. So that was actually the most common pistol, and this was also used through the Korean War, I think into Vietnam, <laughs> people were using these. But I know until Korea, at least, they were used. Now, let's get into the 1911. So who carries a sidearm, first of all? Well, of course, you've got upper enlisted, and you've got officers carrying sidearms, right? And mainly with your upper enlisted, like your first sergeants and your um, battalion sergeant majors and stuff like that, they were going to be issued the 1911s because they got first dibs and, you know, whatever. Just, I mean, with rank comes privilege, I guess. So this is loaded from a seven-round external box magazine, which gives you one more round than the Colt Model 1917. If you want to throw one in the chamber, you've got eight rounds, so you can actually have two more rounds on the Colt Model 1917. But, however, comma, pause for dramatic effect, like the 1903 and what I just said, these were much more expensive and slower to produce. So, in 1918, of course, production ramped up drastically, and by about June and July 1918, they were making a ton of these, still not as many as the Colt Model 1917, which they could have also drawn from civilian um, pistols, so they were already made. But uh, the 1911 was still there, but it was not the most common handgun. Now, who, who else carried a handgun? Well, you see pictures. Uh, Pershing was one of these guys that um, is very tough leader, very, you know, general-esque, I guess. And he wanted, his idea for the Americans was to have them so overly armed, so just ridiculously armed to the teeth, that even, the, even a private would have a sidearm. Because then, you know, you've got as much firepower on the, on the battlefield as possible. So that's what, kind of what he wanted. So you're going to see guys on the front who are privates carrying a Colt Model 1917. Very rarely do you see them carrying a 1911 unless they're in the rear. Um, I don't know what, who got issued what and how that exactly worked. You just don't see a lot of pictures of lower enlisted guys with a 1911. You see a lot of enli uh, upper enlisted and officers with the Colt Model 1917 as well. Again, this is the most common sidearm of the Americans in the First World War. So it's very interesting looking at original footage of the unit that I um, portrayed when I, back when I reenacted. It's very interesting to see guys with no rank on and their privates carrying a holster. If you could get a sidearm, you could carry it. If you could get one issued to you, you could carry it. That's kind of the attitude. So it's, that's another thing that set the Americans apart from the European militaries wholly is because in, in Europe, the pistol was a sign of being an officer, right? Or a senior enlisted. Well, in the American military, it's like, You've got privates, you've got corporals, and you've got second lieutenants carrying sidearms, and you can't tell the difference. The uniforms are very the same, so that's another thing that, that it was just weird. But the thing is, is most European countries had um, had their firearms. Like Germany, for example, had the Gewehr 98, and then all of a sudden they came out with the K98A and Z, the carbines, for specific purposes. Uh, the U.S. just had two rifles and two pistols that were the mainstay of the issued weapons for small arms. Um, again, we use a lot of French weaponry and British weaponry, such as the Lewis gun, the, the um, Show Show, the CSRG-15, the Vickers, and the uh, Hotchkiss Model 1914, I believe it is. Yeah. So we didn't really have a lot of the Browning 1917s and all that stuff that were issued in mass numbers until later in 1918. So these four, these four, uh, r um, not rifles because they're two or handguns, these four firearms were going to be the most commonly used and seen in photographs um, weapons of the ADF. I don't know how many times I just said that. It's very redundant, I know. All right, hopefully this didn't take too long. I tried to stay on point, but um, yeah, it's kind of a cool little topic, and I finally scored a 1911 and can use that to make some more educational videos. That was actually uh, afforded by a YouTube viewers doing super chats on live stream streams and um, my channel members and my Patreon supporters. So that helped offset the cost of that quite a bit. You guys have been wanting me to make a bunch of videos of the 1911. So if you want to support the channel, you want to see more cool videos like this, you can definitely support the channel financially via Patreon or becoming a channel member. Patreon, the link is in the description. Channel member, you hit the join button below. Um, five bucks a month or more on either platform, you can to my Discord server, which is really fun. And we do a lot of cool things and get, get a lot of cool information is exchanged there. And also it helps me do ballistic tests on helmets and body armor and all that stuff and get really super expensive but historically significant firearms to make educational videos on and content on. If you can't support the channel financially, I totally get that. That's not a problem. So make sure you like this video, subscribe if you haven't already. And if you really enjoyed this video and thought the content was decent, go ahead and share it out. 
Um, gun channels, gun related channels, even if it's a historical context, aren't really that popular on YouTube if you haven't noticed. So you sharing the video helps kind of get this content out there. So anything you want to do to support the channel, that's great. And I just bottom line, appreciate you watching this. Let me know if you got any questions. I'll try to answer them. I'm not an expert. I'm just some dude who's obsessed with this stuff and tries to learn as much as possible and spread the spread the joy of the hobby and the um, insane obsession slash addiction to military history. So thank you for watching everybody and we'll see you on the next episode of the First World War.